Our first guest is Vicki McKendall, Administrative Coordinator, Due Process Department, Division of Special Education, who will talk about parent rights. Welcome, Vicki. Thank you for being here. Oh, you're very welcome. It's nice to be here with you. Vicki, I have some questions for you regarding parent rights. Mm -hmm. The federal law, in particular the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA, provides processes for the special education process. Can you tell us a little bit about parent rights? What are the rights parents have as they're going through the special education process? Well, in, in regard to the entire process, from the very beginning to actually providing services, parents have the right to be informed all along the way, everything about every part of the process. They have a right to understand all about the initial referral for evaluation, why their child was referred and what that involves. They have a right to be noticed anytime there's going to be an individualized educational program meeting or an IEP meeting as we call them. They have a right to be informed, to have understanding about what a reevaluation is, how often it takes place and what the specific purpose of it is. And they also have a right to information regarding their disagreement with a particular recommendation that an IEP team has made in terms of due process and what that all involves. So they have a right to be informed all along the way. So it sounds like there are a lot of activities going on throughout this process. Let me ask you about parental consent. Do parents have the right to consent to certain things or not consent to certain things? Yes, they do, absolutely. Um, before a youngster can be evaluated for special education, the parent is given an assessment plan which describes for the parent exactly what areas we're looking at, what areas of suspected disability we believe may be in existence. And we um, spell out for them the kinds of tools that we would use in this evaluation. Then they have a right to consent or to disagree with parts of it or all of it or whatever. Then that's the initial evaluation, the first time we're looking at the youngster. Three years later, or any other time in between the process, we might want to do a reevaluation to redetermine eligibility. We have new information, whatever, to change the program. Um, so they have a there to give us written consent in terms of reevaluation also. We cannot provide any services for a youngster without the parent consent as well. So we've done the assessment or a reevaluation, and that's generated an IEP, which is an offer of education to the youngsters, a specific program and they have a right to agree to it or disagree. They can agree to parts of it or all of it or whatever their feeling is. Um, same with related services. If the youngster requires speech, or occupational therapy, or some other related services, they have a right to agree or disagree or ask for more or less or whatever. Got it. So through those processes, there are opportunities for parents to hear information, determine if they want that service, and then give their consent or not give their consent. Correct. That's absolutely right. Now, there are times when we don't have to secure their consent, which I think we ought to make clear as well. If we're, the school is just going to review existing data that we already have, we don't need to get their consent because that's a student record that we've had for a long time and they're aware of that and so we don't have to get their consent for that and anytime we're administering a test um, that is given to all the students in the school we don't have to seek special permission for that either yeah. but in regard to all of the other things that I mentioned we do need to get their consent so Vicki how do parents find out about their rights well the school district has published a book called a parent's guide to special education services and this is given to the parent every time there's an initial referral for evaluation upon notification of every IEP meeting, upon reevaluation of the child, upon receipt of a request for due process. In fact, parents could have numerous books of these, a whole library full of the, their youngsters receiving services for a very long time. We give it very often. Mm -hmm. I understand. Now, I'm sure throughout this process there's a lot of documentation going on. Do parents have access to the information that's in their student's educational records? Yes, a parent has the right to inspect their student's student records at any time. All they have to do is give us notice and we're obligated to provide those records for them to observe them or to look at them or to receive a copy of them within five days, which is really a very short turnaround time if a parent is requesting them. Um, the district may charge for the records if we choose to. It's within the law that we can do that, but in our case, we 
rarely ask for parents to pay for the records unless it's some very unusual situation. I see. So Vicki, can you tell me what are some ways that parents can be involved in or should be involved in the IEP process? Well, the intent of IDEA is that parents basically have a very strong, meaningful participation in the entire process from understanding why we want to do an assessment, what we're going to do during the assessment, what goes on at the IEP meeting. Um, we're always noticing them anytime we're going to have an IEP. We tell them the date, the time, the place, the reason, who's going to be present at the meeting, and give them a statement of the right of their, their right to electronically tape the proceedings if they wish to. If the parent is unable to attend the meeting, um, it's really up to the local agency, the school district, to try to make the meeting in a place, in a time that's convenient for the parent. We very rarely would go on and hold a meeting without a parent's presence unless they've asked us to, because it's really important that they provide meaningful participation. They are always a part of all of the decisions that are made by the IEP team. Eligibility is the first item on the agenda, you might say, in an IEP meeting to determine if the youngster meets one of the criteria for eligibility as a special education youngster, whether the child has a learning disability or has an orthopedic problem or a health issue. And uh, parents are a part of formulating those decisions about eligibility. And they're also a part of formulating the, <clears throat> the district will make an offer in terms of a specific placement, which will include the location, the kind of personnel, uh, the equipment and the facilities. Excuse me, I have a little cold. <clears throat> that the um, youngster would be in with the program that the parent would be um, given the choice to accept or reject. And so, yeah, we want them to be a part of all of that. And we want their feedback and their information that they have. And hopefully the team will respond to all of it and take it into consideration when they formulate their free and appropriate public education offer. Okay. Vicki, can you talk just a little bit about that statement, free and appropriate public education? What does that mean? Well, that's really the basis for IDEA. It's We call it in business, we call it FAPE, um, free and appropriate public education. And what that means is that it's specially designed instruction at no cost to the family that's really designed to meet the unique needs of all students with disabilities. I see. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Um, if neither of the parents can participate in the meeting, it's really up to the agency to help ensure their involvement in some other way, possibly through uh, individual or conferencing, uh, telephonic conferencing, video conferencing, that kind of thing. And if a parent just truly can't make it, then we spend the energy of trying to get them in to go through the IEP or to at least go through it with them on the telephone or meeting them at their work location or whatever so that they would be informed before they give their consent. So for par in order for parents to be involved, of course, they have to be able to understand everything that's going on in the meeting so they can be an active participant. Right. What about a parent who maybe their first language is in English or maybe they have a hearing impairment? What happens in that process for them? We will provide interpreters for all families that need that kind of service, um, either for the deaf and hard of hearing, sign language, or Spanish interpretation, Korean, whatever that is. And also, even for people who are speaking English, this is a, it's a, it's a, you know, we in education often, you know, use a lot of terminology that parents might not be familiar with. So it really behooves us to check for understanding through every, you know, bit of the process to make sure that parents understand in whatever language we're using. So it looks like there are lots of opportunities for parents to act as partners in this process and be actively involved in the development of the IEP. Absolutely. What happens if a parent disagrees with something that happens in the IEP process? Okay. Well, there are a couple of routes they can go. Um, there's a parent complaint procedure. The state sets up a parent complaint procedure, which basically talks about the implementation issues that haven't taken place, that maybe an IEP um, says a child will get speech or a child will get occupational therapy or something, and it doesn't happen for whatever reason, then they have a right to make a state complaint. If they're unhappy with the evaluation or the eligibility determination or the placement or the specific services, then they can file for due process to try to resolve their dispute with the district. 
um, procedures have to be set up through the state to handle both of those processes and our state in California absolutely does both of those. Mm -hmm. um, the due process system for the resolution of IEP disputes is set up through the California Special Education Hearing Office. The um, state department contracts with the McGeorge School of Law to provide those services. And then the complaint procedures are separate, which are handled by the CDE or the Department of Education. Uh, further information, again, can be found in this publication regarding both of those processes. Also, though, in the Los Angeles Unified School District, we really want to attempt to resolve disputes in the best way possible. And going through due process is a right that the law affords families, but we would very much like to work with families to informally resolve disputes before they get to that level. So when there is a disagreement at an IEP meeting, the chair of the IEP will explain that not only do they have the opportunity to go to due process, but if they would like to first try and go through one of LA Unified's informal dispute resolution processes, they have the opportunity to do that as well. We have developed a wonderful informal resolution process. It's set up so that this is a little brochure that describes it that you can receive at your student's school. And what it does is the process is set up to take place within 20 business days so that we can get in there, understand what the parents' issues are, and try to work with them to resolve the issues to their satisfaction. They always have the opportunity to go to due process, but this is a much speedier process. And once there is a resolution, families can start implementing the services right away. So it's really a wonderful, wonderful process. And I would urge all parents to use this process. It sounds like this process would be beneficial so that parents and teachers or parents and school administrators can talk about what the issues are kind of at a general level and see if they can find a way to resolve it without going through some of the more extensive processes that Correct. you have to do for filing for due process. Right, absolutely. It uh, gives the school the opportunity to work one-on-one -on -one with the family. If you need a, a, an objective party, one of my staff can work with the school or with the DIS department or whatever. We have it set up in various different ways so that we can get at each dispute in a really efficient manner. And it's working very well. We have a client satisfaction survey that we send out at the end of the process and parents are very pleased with the process overall. So we're real pleased with that. So Vicki, what about the more structured process though for filing for due process? What's the procedure there? Oh, okay. At the IEP meeting, if you indicate that you want to go on to formal due process, we have a form that's given to the family that they're to fill out and send to Sacramento. And this form identifies the name of the child, the address of the residence of the child, the name of the school, all that general identifying information. They're also supposed to give a description of what the issues are. What are the nature of the problems, including all the related facts that they can <laughs> muster. Um, they're also supposed to give a proposed resolution. What it is that they're seeking, what remedy it is that they're seeking. The notice must remain confidential and we, the state has to have processes in place to um, assist the parents with filing for these processes, which they do, and we have this SC-17 form that does take care of that. Prior to the hearing, and when you do file for due process, the hearing office receives it today. Within a week's time, you as the parent will receive back a, um, a huge package of information explaining to you, giving you hearing dates, which are generally set out about three weeks from that time, but also explaining to you that if you would choose to, you could go through mediation and that the state has mediators available to meet with the family and the district to kind of, in a neutral way, facilitate discussion and come to some kind of a resolution. The mediation must be voluntary on part of both sides, you know, the district can say, no, I don't want to mediate, or the parent can say, I don't want to mediate. We do mediate in, I would say, 95% of the cases. Um, and generally, we have a resolution the first time out in well over 75 to 80, 85% of the cases, we do come to resolution that first meeting. Sometimes we don't, and we think that other things need to be done, maybe some new assessments or that kind of thing. So we'll come to an interim agreement and then decide to meet again. Uh, very few cases go directly to a hearing. Um, 
the mediation also is not to be, and it's clearly stated in the law, it's not to be used to delay or to deny a parent's right to due process. It's also supposed to be conducted by an impartial mediator who's trained in effective mediation techniques. And the ones that the hearing office has hired, they are contract employees. They don't work for the school district. They don't work for the hearing office. They're independent contractors. And for the most part, they are excellent. They go through extensive training. They understand special education law. And they're basically there to facilitate conversation. And that's what their skill is. So Vicki, in this mediation process, I'm sure that there's, it ends up with a written document that provides the details of what's agreed upon. Right, we work? do come up with a final mediation agreement or an interim mediation agreement that lists all the terms that we've agreed to um, and dates by which they're due. Then at the end of the mediation, whoever has done it on the district side will route that to all of the parties who have some responsibility for implementation. The discussions in mediation have to remain confidential. And if the mediation fails and you end up at a hearing, all the conversations that take place in mediation cannot be shared with the hearing officer, can't be used as evidence. And what this does, it allows for free flow of information so that if I'm trying to work something out with you, I know you're not gonna use that against me kind of thing. So it allows for people to enter into negotiations and be as honest and upfront as they possibly can. Um, parties to the mediation are on, some of the mediators ask you to sign a confidentiality clause as well. Okay. Not all of them do, but some do. Vicki, in the short time that we have left, can you talk about a hearing? If a parent really does need to go to a hearing, what's the process for that? It's a very, very formal process. It's held at a time and place that is convenient to the parent. Generally, we hold the hearings on Beaudry. If there's some exception to the parent being able to get there, we will consider finding another location, but there are all kinds of requirements to the location. Beaudry being the district's yes, main, the district headquarters. main headquarters. Uh -huh. yes. It's conducted by a person who's knowledgeable regarding special education law. The hearing office currently uses attorneys that have gone through extensive training and they do become hearing officers. Um, the family has the right to be accompanied by an attorney, a friend, an advocate, whatever. They have the right to present evidence um, in a written form and do oral arguments and compel witnesses. They have the right to a written or an electronic verbatim record of the hearing. They have a right to be informed 10 days prior to the hearing what issues are to be decided. Both sides have to do that. 10 days before the hearing, you have to exchange what your issues are and what your proposed remedies are. Then five business days before the hearing, you have to exchange your evidence, which is all your documents, all your records, anything you want to enter into evidence. And you also have to give a list of the people you're going to call as witnesses and what they're going to generally testify about. You should get, if you just start the process today, you should have, a, if you don't decide to mediate or get a continuance or decide jointly to postpone it, you should have a written decision within 45 days from the date of the request. Um, and either party makes request an extension, which generally happens. I've rarely seen one that happens within 45 days. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen one that happens within 45 days because there's so many things that go on in the process. Um, when the decision comes out and either side, if they don't agree with the decision, they have a right to appeal it in a district court. If you're in disagreement with the appeal, you can take it before the Ninth Circuit. And if you're in disagreement with that, you can go to the Supreme Court. I see. So there are lots of ways to protect, for parents to have protection in this process to be able to appeal or to discuss what their absolutely, concerns are. Absolutely, absolutely. And lastly, I've heard of something called stay put. Can right. you tell me what that means? <laughs> stay put, right. During the pendency of any administrative proceeding, um, the youngster is entitled to maintain the last agreed upon and implemented services. So if a youngster was in a special day class receiving four hours of speech and language every week, say, mm -hmm. during the pendency of the proceedings, the child remains in that placement and receives the same services until there's some kind of either a decision or an agreement otherwise. Now, the, the two parties can agree to a different location or a different level of service. Um, that's okay, too. But if there's a disagreement, the child stays put until the proceedings are finished. Thank you very much, Vicki. You're this very was welcome. Very, this is 
lots of good information right. for parents and their rights in the special right. education mm -hmm. process. It is very important that parents understand their rights within this process. Absolutely. Please visit the LAUSD Division of Special Education website at sped.lausd.net for additional resources and information.